Hi everyone, it's great to see you. In today's video, I'll be talking a little bit about psychological assessment, specifically the process for mental health constructs of defining, operationalizing, detecting, and measuring the kinds of symptoms and disorders that people may experience. So this is a complicated and, and, and tough topic uh, because assessment can take many different forms and it can have many different purposes, each with their own different specific needs. Um, I'll be going through just a few examples today of the many, many ways to assess mental health. Um, I'll talk a little bit about some specific styles and examples and a few of the important key features of each. Uh, we'll end with a little summary and that'll be today's talk. So, um, again, what exactly is psychological assessment? It's this process of taking a variable and somehow trying to quantify it uh, with regard to a mental experience someone is having. Now, I've mentioned at other times that mental disorders do not exist per se. They are not tangible physical things in the real world no more so than other psychological constructs like extroversion or intelligence. And so that leaves us with some interesting difficulties. There's no blood test for depression. There's no brain scan for anxiety, right? We have to somehow glean that info from the person who's experiencing it and find a way to measure. So uh, what are some of the ways of doing that and why do we do that? Well, first of all, Clinicians need to know these things, right? So an, an individual working with another individual or a couple or a family or a group of clients, the clinician needs to be able to measure how everyone's doing. So there's this kind of uh, individualized need for assessment purposes. And then there are bigger picture needs for assessment purposes, things like epidemiology, right? How do we answer questions like, how common is schizophrenia? We need a way of measuring it and applying that to an entire population. Uh, public health efforts, um, research studies, right? We, we need to measure and define and operationalize these constructs in ways that are consistent and that work well. So um, another important caveat to make before going into any of the details is that with any psychological test, we want it to be as reliable and valid as possible for as many different populations as possible. Those two terms sometimes get mixed up, so here's a real quick reminder of what they refer to. Reliability has to do with the accuracy or truth of the results that come from a test. So reliability is about accuracy, truth, getting the right answer. Okay, if somebody does have a true amount of an eating disorder symptom and the test correctly identifies that true level of that symptomatology, then it would be reliable. Any error is the opposite of reliability. Okay, and then validity refers to meaningfulness. Um, other synonyms would be utility. Uh, that it's helpful, that it's informative, right? That it is doing the thing it's supposed to do. So interestingly, we could reliably assess something that's not valid if it's not a part of the picture that we're trying to put together about a person. Um, and there's quite a bit of research that goes into ensuring that our um, test instruments are as valid and reliable as possible. Okay, so uh, why don't we walk through some examples of different kinds of assessment. And like I said, these vary a bit depending on what the needs are that are trying to be met. The first that I'll talk about is the psychological interview. So an interview is exactly how it sounds. It is like a conversation. There are questions being asked and information is being exchanged between two or more people. Um, interviews can range from very, very structured to highly unstructured. And so by an unstructured interview, what I mean is that a professional might literally sit down with a client and ask things like, how are you doing? How have you been feeling lately? Uh, what terms would you use to describe your symptoms? Um, would you say things are different than they were a week, two weeks, three weeks ago? And if so, what has changed? 
um, describe overall how your life is going, right? So questions like this where it's literally unstructured. And the professional will start with open-ended questions and then sort of follow the client's lead as they describe the things that are going on. Really important tip about doing unstructured interviews is to start with questions that are as open as possible. Um, a good way to know that you're asking a useful open-ended question is that it starts with what or how. Those are some of the best ways grammatically to phrase your sentence so that you'll be getting as much information from the patient as possible. If instead you ask yes or no questions or kind of multiple choicey types of questions, you'll limit the ways that the person can respond to you and you may get less data. Okay, so open-ended, um, not much of an agenda, right? That would be an unstructured interview. There's a whole spectrum here, right? Sometimes people will do a semi-structured interview where they have some planned aspects and then other parts that are uh, sort of spontaneous, so they'll talk about whatever comes up. And then there are what are called structured or highly planned and regimented interviews. So one example of that is what's called the SCID. It stands for the Structured Clinical Interview for DSM Diagnoses. Right? Uh, one version of it looks something like this. So you start with, it's uh, almost a, a choose your own adventure sort of thing. You're, you're asking the client questions about the things they're experiencing and then depending on their answers, you follow a flow chart through this large booklet which when you reach an end point, it will sort of spit out for you these would be the appropriate diagnostic labels for that person. So there's no wiggle room or flexibility at all, really. Your decisions are kind of made for you. You ask these questions in this order. So the skid is extremely highly structured, and extremely unstructured interviews might start with very open things, like tell me about your childhood. Tell me about how your week has been going. Um, when I'm first meeting a patient, I really like to start with an unstructured interview, but I also find it very important to complement that with some sort of structured data as a, um, a balance, okay? In addition to interviews, there are also what are called psychological tests. There are hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of tests, but one thing we can do to sort of break the conversation down into simple parts is to think of them as projective and objective tests. So projective tests are those which have an unstructured uh, set of responses that the person can give. The stimuli are the same every time, but then the way that the person responds is open-ended. Okay, and I'll give you a few examples. Uh, the first and probably most famous or infamous, depending on how you feel about it, would be the Rorschach or the inkblot test. This is not a real Rorschach card, but it looks very similar to many that you might see. So you would literally hand your subject this card and ask them the prompt, which is, what might this be? So you have your client, patient, research subject, what have you. Take a moment to look it over and think about it and give you multiple responses about what they see. Some of the cards are colorful, like this one. And people will respond in all sorts of ways. They may see something that uses the entire image. They may look at a tiny little part of it and see something interesting there. Uh, but they'll give you different responses about what they're seeing there. Here's another example that would be much like a real Rorschach card. Uh, so as you can see, this one is black and white, uh, but importantly, they're literally made by putting blots of ink on paper, folding them, and unfolding. That's why they're all symmetrical. Um, so you go through these cards, you have people describe what they're seeing to you, and the idea is that because it's an ambiguous, unstructured task, parts of people's subconscious will come out in the sorts of responses that they give. So ideas about conflict, uh, unconscious disturbances about things that they aren't aware are bothering them may sort of pop out in the way that they see the image. Um, there's a really enormous literature about using the Rorschach and, and there's some contention in the field. Some providers find it to be unreliable. Others argue that there are certain cases in which it can be really informative. That's sort of a heated debate. Um, 
but it's this fascinating thing because it's open-ended, so people can tell you all sorts of different things that they may see. Here's another example of a projective test. It's called the TAT, or the Thematic Apperception Test. This isn't the real card from the TAT, but it's a lot like them. TAT cards always include one or more people with ambiguous expressions on their faces and ambiguous situations. And you ask the client to tell you a story about what's going on. They have to give you a beginning, middle, and an end, and then you're able to sort of pull relationship themes and conflict dynamics out of the kinds of things people say. So here's one example. Uh, your patient may look at this and see a friendly conversation. They may see disagreement. They say things about... Uh, sibling rivalries or conflict with authority and after going through several of those cards and having your person tell you stories about each one you begin to see um, a glimpse into this person's inner world sort of subconsciously how do they perceive relationships with others in life there are many other kinds of projective tests and some are as simple as giving the beginning of a sentence and having the person end the sentence with whatever comes to mind first so I like blank uh, my father is blank. I really hate it when blank. Okay, things like this. So again, the point is that a projective test has an ambiguous stimuli and then the subject responds to it in an open-ended way. The opposite sort of psychological test is an objective test. So an objective test has a specific set of kinds of responses that the subject can give which then allow us to mathematically score it somehow. So they will get one or more outcomes in a quantified way that refer to some psychological variable. I'll show you a few examples of these. Um, some of them are broad and cover many different kinds of variables all at once. And probably the most well known is the MMPI or the Minnesota Multiphasic Personality Inventory. Um, the test sheet looks like this. It is 567, so a bit long, 567 true or false items. So your subject will mark true or false on each of those after uh, reading through this booklet with all sorts of different items covering a whole range of things that have to do with personality and mental health. Um, I dislike having people around me, number 281. True or false? Um, number one, I like mechanics magazines, right? True or false? Um, and through mathematically scoring all these relationships between how these variables have in the past predicted whether people show certain symptoms or not, um, you get a printout with your subjects' um, severity or strength ratings of different kinds of variables, things from anxiety, depression, masculinity, femininity, outgoingness, right? A whole host of things. Okay, so that's one example which is a, a sort of broad, um, comprehensive objective test. Others are a bit more focused. So another example is the state trait anxiety inventory or the STAY, uh, which looks like this. Uh, this one's a bit briefer. It's 40 items and instead of true or false you rate from one to four, so almost never, sometimes, often, or almost always. An example item being, I feel secure. Or another example being, I am cool, calm, and collected. So someone who rates almost never is indicating more anxiety than someone who rates often. I feel cool, calm, and collected. Right, and by going through the items and how they responded to them, you can tally up a score that reflects the person's state anxiety or their trait anxiety. Other kinds of objective tests are even more specific. So a great example of that is the fleet of Connors tests for ADHD. Um, one of them looks like this. Self-report form, again, um, the client is filling out how frequently a number of different problems occur for them that have to do with inattention and hyperactivity, difficulty paying attention to things, difficulty staying on task, having impulsivity, right? Uh, so this is a very particular objective test that informs the clinician or the researcher about one diagnosis, that being ADHD. 
Now I've mentioned a number of things here that are self-report and that has some strengths and weaknesses, right? On the one hand, you might think who knows the person better than themselves. On the other hand, sometimes we're not great reporters of our own thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Sometimes we want to cover up how bad we're doing. Other times we may want to inflate our symptoms for a variety of reasons, right? Or sometimes people just lack insight needed to be accurate. So one neat thing about a number of different objective tests that are out there is that some of them come in forms where somebody else reports about the person. So the Connors, for instance, has a teacher rating scale. Now, if an eight-year-old doesn't do a great job of knowing how hyper he is, maybe his teacher does, or maybe his parent does. There are parent forms as well. So point being, objective tests are very structured. They give the subject a specific set of ways to respond, whether that be true-false, multiple choice, rate from one to five, like a, a Likert scale. Um, and you can take those numbers and mathematically come up with a score on some important criteria many of which have to do with mental health indicators. And then the clinician, researcher, epidemiologist, what have you, they can take that score, look at it, and look at the established cutoffs and say, oh, this person's score is above the cutoff. That's possibly indicative of them meeting criteria for the diagnosis. If they're below the cutoff, then maybe they don't. Okay, so quick recap. We've been talking about psychological assessment, which takes many forms. Um, one is the interview, which can range from structured to unstructured. Another is the projective test, which involves giving an ambiguous stimuli and gleaning info from the open-ended responses. And the third is the objective test, which has some sort of mathematical scoring involved. And all of these, again, we want to make sure that they are as reliable, in other words, true and accurate, and valid in other words, meaningful and useful as possible. So um, that's just another way to get to know the people that we're working with, right? The, the best approach is to do something well-rounded. So couple an interview with a few objective tests, maybe also interview the teacher, maybe also interview the parents, right? The more sources of data that we can triangulate, the better answer we're going to get in terms of measuring psychopathology. So uh, that's today's tricky, difficult topic. Thanks for listening and have a wonderful day.